It is a major night. We are going to begin this night with two really, really wonderful and extraordinary guests. Uh, we have Jamuna and Shirley here, and they're going to uh, give us some testimony. I just want you to know, we also have here on the platform this incredible man, Reg Rock Gray, the creator, <laughs> right? One of the key inventors of Flex. My name is Peter Sellers, and I'm working with this man. And I have to say, uh, what's incredible is when you are working with the old master, when you're working with the grand master, the single great man behind the art form. He is 33 years old. So it's really, it's just sad to see, you know, like what happens with the older people. <laughs> uh, but. But Reg, I was wondering if you just tell us about what it means to found something that needs to be founded, and what it means to create a new art form, a new vocabulary. Cool, cool. Well, hello, Jacob Spillo. How are you guys doing tonight? Feeling great? Oh, yeah. This is going to be a good crowd. I can tell already. <laughs> OK, guys. So I mean, um, creating flexion is one of those things that you don't know what's going to happen until it's on, on one of these stages, um, you know? It's one of the things that um, I didn't expect to happen. It's just something that um, you know, me and a, gr a group of my friends were doing because we wanted to be different from everybody else that was on this show called Flex in Brooklyn that we uh, used to dance on. It was a public access channel where uh, the show with the name Flex actually came from, hence Flex in Brooklyn. So um, you know, there was a, it, it, it's, the style of it is really Jamaican, it's really raw, and it's really dance hall. So it, it has a lot of culture in it. So, um, you know, we, we kind of, uh, me and my guys, we kind of created this style um, doing the things that we normally wouldn't do, I want to say, because we used to watch a lot of movies and we used to watch cartoons and we always try to animate and be <laughs> those cartoons or those movies. And um, we didn't have like a, a huge million dollar budget, so we didn't have strings coming on stage and swinging back and forth. So we try to create that within our own bodies and with our, you know, with our strength and everything else. So we, we, we started to do these things on stage uh, all the time. And um, people in from, the people from Brooklyn and that used to watch this, this TV show all the time just started to pick up the same style that we were doing. And we didn't want nobody to do it because it was a competition, right? We wanted to keep everything to ourselves. <laughs> but um, everyone started to pick it up and um, it, it started, it just became a phenomenon. And it's like, wow, like you just see it everywhere now. And it's like, okay, well. Thank you. You know, <laughs> you know, you can't. You know, it's not, I don't know really how. You, it's not really something to digest. It's just something you just say like, "This is what it is. This is my duty. This is my call." And so I guess I have to get it done. You know. <laughs> Every country we have taken this show to, we are greeted by a whole heap of kids who've seen everybody on YouTube already <laughs> and know how many stars are on the stage. It's really, really incredible. Could I just say one of the most important reasons we're all here is, of course, as Americans, but also as human beings, the whole point is every single day of our lives to be creative and to find creative solutions to what the problems are in front of us. Right now, the major problem, of course, the issue, the main conversation in the United States of America is Black Lives Matter. And we have to hold that conversation powerfully in communities all across this country. And that conversation has to be articulated and nuanced. And we all have to get better at it. But until these things are talked about, just like in your own family, nothing happens. And we have to find a way to talk about it together. One of the coolest things about the arts is the arts creates a space where people can meet as equals. That's the deal. That space doesn't exist in life, which is why we need art to insist that that space is there and to keep that space open and protected. Tonight, we have two magnificent people to join us and to testify right here in the situation. I'm wondering if, Shirley, would you just start out and just lay upon us what you're doing and how you're doing it? So first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm just ecstatic to be here and to be in the presence of these geniuses. Uh, I saw the show already, so I can tell you they are geniuses. <laughs> it's 
So uh, my name is Shirley Edgerton, and uh, I'm currently the cultural proficiency coach for the Pittsfield Public Schools. First time. <laughs> yeah. This is the first time this position has been in place, and that's due to the um, commitment uh, of the super, current superintendent and the school committee. Uh, and I see some of the folks in the audience tonight, so it's nice to see some folks that I know here. Um, I'm also the director of a program that's called the Rites of Passage and Empowerment Program for Girls. Uh, and we, thank you, thank you. And we basically mentor and intr introduce these young ladies to um, aspects of life to help them to be self-sufficient uh, self and productive. So that, of course that includes college tours. Uh, in February of this past uh, year, we went to South Africa to do a service learning project. So we want them to be locally and, and globally astute as to what's happening in the world. So, um, and, and so I'm, I'm really, I'm excited to be here to have an opportunity to share in this conversation tonight. I'm gonna tell you a story of uh, something that happened to me when I was about 16. I'm ageless, I won't tell you what my age is. So. But when I was 16 years of age, I was pretty, you know, considered pretty smart in school. I was getting ready to graduate at 17 years of age. I would have been uh, the plan, I would be entering uh, college. And uh, I only had like a half a semester of school. So anyway, I was in this five and 10 cent store in, uh, in the North Bronx. And all of a sudden I heard this noise, this conversation, and the manager was talking to a group of young people. So I'm hearing it, but I'm not hearing it. And all of a sudden the manager's by, by my side. And he says to me, you two, you get out of here. So I'm thinking, oh, can't be me. You know, I'm smart. I'm a college student. You know, I'm a good citizen. You can't be talking to me like that. So I ignored him initially. So he said, did you hear me? Get out of here. So I'm like, wow, he's talking to me. And I said, well, what's the problem? You know what you're doing. You're stealing just like the rest of them. What? I said, you're accusing me of stealing? Me? I work. I said, I have a part-time job. I'm on my way to college. You can't be talking to me. I don't do it. Get out of here. Wow. Well, what a disappointment. And um, it registered that the other young people were of color. I was of color. So he was making some assumptions about who we were. And that was my, my major introduction to racism. And I cannot tell you where that propelled me to. I decided after that I hated all white people, excuse me, <laughs> hated every white person that I saw. Okay, started reading the Black Panthers newspaper and you know, to my family's dismay, started denouncing Christianity. Can't tell you how many ministers I have in my family. You know, so, but, but it, it, it put me on a road until I think I was about a junior in college that I realized, okay, that that was an incident with one particular human being and that it wasn't the whole race. So I just wanted to share that story. Jamuna, take us please into your work. Okay, so I'm Yvette Jamuna Serker. I, I consider myself a theater and education activist. So what does that mean? I'm a playwright, I'm a director, I'm a producer, and I'm an educator. I am now in Pittsfield Public Schools as well. I'm a writing and media specialist for Pittsfield Public Schools and I'm on the diversity team. And I'm now on the board of directors of the Pittsfield Education Foundation. And how I came upon this path, uh, can, I guess we just go back to being born and reared in New Orleans, Louisiana, as the daughter of Nicaraguan immigrants. And it's really hard to escape the horrors of racism growing up in the American South. Um, my father is part East Indian, and he has the very dark skin of the Hindi. And when he first stepped off, he was a captain in the Merchant Marines, and when he first stepped off the boat, <laughs> literally, and walked into uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, he was attacked and beaten because of the color of his skin. My mother was a nurse, a licensed uh, nurse practitioner, and on her first job, she was asked to perform the services of a maid. 
And the nurses, the other uh, white nurses, would not eat in the same room as her. So my mother was asked to eat her lunch into, in a closet. And she had to eat lunch every day in a closet. It was horribly humiliating for her. They came here hoping to realize the American dream. The good, de the good news is they did. They persevered and created um, a wonderful life for themselves. And they were successful in their professions and valued in their communities and imparted this understanding of the importance of education. Unfortunately, they weren't able to save their six children from racism. And so as I stepped into my life, I have had countless experiences with racism and oppression and injustice. But the few that I think are pertinent to this conversation, first I'll start with just when I was a teenager and I was dancing with a ballet company in New Orleans and um, a choreographer had come in and set a, a ballet on the company and gave me a featured role. And I was very excited and then she left town and the artistic director promptly took that role away from me and gave it to another dancer and gave it to a white dancer and put me in the back of the stage and said he didn't think the audiences would appreciate me, a brown skinned girl, having a featured role over a white girl and he didn't think the audiences would want a brown skinned girl to have a featured role. And then um, I fast forward to college and I was taking an essay writing course and my assignment was to write a true story. So I wrote a true story about a summer that I had spent in New York City. I was dancing on scholarship at Alvin Ailey and I was looking for a place to live. And a friend of mine said, oh, I'm leaving this place and call this guy up, I told him about you. So I called him up and said, hi, I heard about this place. Yeah, he said, I heard you're really reliable. I want you to live there. What are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm here. I'm dancing on scholarship at Alvin Ailey. And he goes, are you black? And I said, excuse me? And he goes, wait, hold on. <laughs> and then he comes back and tells me the apartment's taken. So I'm like, OK. <laughs> um, so then I fast forward to a conversation that I had with a theatrical agent who said to me, um, if you want to be an actress, you should speak with a Spanish accent all the time. And he, he said, um, pretend like you're from Mexico. And because he, he said, there's lots of roles for maids. And so <laughs> the only auditions he sent me out on were for maids. And I thought, well, OK. I had a couple of thoughts. One, decades after my mother was asked to eat in a closet and perform the duties of a maid as a professional nurse. And here I am being asked to put my identity in the closet and to do this to play a maid. And I thought, wow, well, we've come full circle. And I thought I could crumble. I could get upset and angry. Or I could do something about this. And fortunately, I had the benefit of my parents uh, making sure I had a good education. I went to a phenomenal performing arts high school in New Orleans, a phenomenal academic high school for more, New, in New Orleans. I got my bachelor's degree from Cornell. I got my master's degree from NYU. And so I said, if I want to have a, a career in the performing arts, I'm just going to do it myself. And so I started writing plays and directing and producing and teaching so that I could empower the next generation of artists of color. And so that is my life's work now. I write, I direct, I produce, I choreograph, and I teach. And I teach children to make their own way in this world. So. Shirley, would you just give us a few more steps of your empowerment process with these young women? Okay, absolutely. So, Besides the um, workshops that we have, um, we ensure that they have a cultural experience. So that's the arts, that's history. Um, as a matter of fact, when we went to Ghana in 2014, we made sure that we went to uh, Du Bois site there, home site there. Um, so every day, you know, we, we did a, a tremendous play with uh, Jamuna and it was entitled Enough, E-N-U-F. And these were stories that the young ladies had written about their experiences being young women of color in, Ber in the Berkshires. One of the young ladies described herself as a raisin in a bowl of milk. 
you know? And she, what she was talking about is being a young person of color in a sea of whiteness and the challenges of being that person, being in the classroom and, you know, particularly if it's a high honors class, an AP class, being the only one and somehow having the burden of answering for the whole uh, African American population. You know, somehow being distanced from other kids of color who may end up uh, in a, a different type of academic situation. So through the incredible position that I have with the school department, um, which puts me in a situation to teach cultural competence, and I'm just so proud of the teachers and the administrators in the system who understand that there's a need for a mind shift, okay? We, we have a, a change in the demographics in the Berkshires, you know, so we have to address that because we want to continue to have this wonderful life that many of us have been uh, able to experience. But there are lots of young people of color that don't have the, that experience. So one of the things that I do is I teach cultural competence to the teachers. So the young ladies that I work with, they can have a, a, a positive experience. The teachers understand why it's important to have a multicultural education, why it's important to understand that there's a difference between how we live our lives as middle class people versus those who are in poverty or under resource situations. So because of my experiences as, as a teenager, um, I'm sure that that's why I'm on the path that I'm on. That's why I've dedicated my life to mentoring young people, teaching where I can, and sharing to try to make a difference in our local community as, as, as well as anywhere that I may travel. Thank you so much. You want to add one more thing? Add one thing. Okay, so um, Peter over dinner was asking about solutions. What, what are the next steps? And my mantra right now as the next step of dealing with this massive quantum uh, demographic shift that's happening in America, right? The 2010 uh, United States Census um, indicated that four out of five newborns in 2010 in America were children of color. And so now it's six years later and they're entering school. And I believe that, that, that this demographic shift is what's creating so much tension in this country right now because it's a shifting of power. It's a shifting of our power sh structure. And that is playing out here on a smaller scale and a far less violent scale, but it is happening here in Berkshire County. And so what I am saying to everyone is, what is your expectation? Think about your expectation. If you expect that a child is going to perform poorly because of the color of his skin, if a child is going to be a criminal just because of the color of his skin or her skin, if you have that expectation, you are creating that reality. But if you have the expectation that that child is going to succeed, irregardless of the color of his or her skin, that that child is going to contribute tremendously to our communities, then you are creating that reality. And so to me, think about your expectation and let that be your next step. Thank you. The only scary people are the ones who never had to struggle. <laughs> so anyway, let's go to where we are. What you're going to see tonight is all the stories are coming directly from the dancers, are coming from their lives, are coming from actual experiences. Unlike what you see on television, which has been made up by somebody. This is actual, put it out there in your own body, with your own music, with music you love. Flexin is a response to a very specific, challenging set of life situations, and the response is classic. It's about whatever obstacle is in front of you, you have to respond in the moment with maximum creativity, inventiveness, and just sheer brilliance. The moves you'll see tonight are improvised. This show is never the same any two nights. These performers are in the African-American tradition of improvisation, which is the classic thing 
of you have to bring your all to every moment in your life, whatever you're faced with. You have to be able to re reinvent who you are. So the steps are things like bone breaking, the techniques, because you will be broken down bone by bone and shattered every single day of your life by somebody who wants to do that. And how do you rebuild yourself in some new and amazing form that nobody's ever seen before? Of course, you know gliding. You'll recognize post Michael Jackson what it means to stay smooth. Stay smooth and move smooth and move through the obstacle. Actually, move through the obstacle, not lose your cool, not lose your cookies, not lose your life. Stay alive and gliding. Another key, key move in flexing is get low. What it means to fly under the radar. And you will see this is some of the most amazing dancing in the world. It's people who are moving across this floor super fast, but not standing up. But being able to stay low and move inside and underneath the situation and across. You'll also see connecting. Connecting is this incredible, you know, what it means. Need to connect. It's using sign language, every possible way of signing what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, and taking it to the nth degree. So it's post-Egyptian, it's intergalactic level of communication that's happening from human beings and happening across human beings. And this kind of breathtaking, extreme level of connecting, of communication over and above existing languages. Again, New vocabulary needed to be created because there are new realities that the old vocabularies cannot communicate. And I would just also say, you know, super important, you know, in, in the middle of, of all this connecting, bone breaking, gliding, Reg Rock Gray inventing pausing. Pausing is one of the most profound of these steps. What it means is what you would do with a video on your phone, of move it backwards and forwards, stop it, move it backwards and forwards, and take any move and break it apart into all of its elements. Analyze the before and after. Slow it down, understand it. Recognize what the full effects of it are. And as Reg was saying, it's like animation or Hollywood CGI special effects like the bullet that goes through in slow-mo and like rips through each layer of skin. This is a group of artists making their own movies with their own bodies and nothing else. And you will watch virtual reality become reality. That is the courage and the brilliance of this moment right now in America where the solutions actually are creative solutions. We all now need to be particularly creative and courageous about that creativity. Please, we need you to do two things with us. One is, when you see something you like or that is just unbelievable, make some noise. Right? Is that understood? Yes? Hello? Hello? Right? What they used to say in the vaudeville, right? Is this an audience or an oil painting? <laughs> Make yourself known. And normally, normally what happens is they play you a recorded announcement at this moment saying, turn off your phones. The opposite. Turn your phones on and set them to photography. Okay? And... Send this out on Facebook or whatever. Hashtag flexin at Jacob's Pillow. Photograph everything and make sure this goes outside this building now. That's right. <laughs> One warning. It's going to get hot in here. It's going to get very hot in here. So realize the emergency exits are right here, right here. <laughs> Back there and back there, all right? You just, you, you just need to know. <laughs> Meantime, protocol is serious. Call it out when you see something amazing, right? Because that's totally what the dancers are doing. You'll hear everything is moving, and it's moving fast. And move with it. Have a great night. Let's start the music. Let's go. Let's go.